I think I got the recording going. Okay, so just a reminder, this talk is gonna be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. So just to give you a heads up that that's happening. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Tian, who's gonna introduce our speaker today. Um, and then when we're done, we'll probably stop the video recording, have lots of time for questions and chit chat and catch up with everybody. Good to see you guys. Hi everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jesse Orline who is a PhD student at Columbia University. Um, she has asked us to let anyone watching this either live or in the future to know that um, she is going to be finishing up this year and is on the job market uh, for teaching positions. So if any leads or knowledge of any of this, uh, to please let her know. And today, Jesse will be talking to us about uh, climate modeling and math. Take it away. Okay, uh, so I'll be talking about using climate models to understand the interaction between two different layers of the atmosphere. Um, and some of this later uh, will be talking about work um, that I did with Gabriel Kyoto at ETH Zurich um, and Lorenzo Polvani at Columbia. Um, but I want to start um, by asking what you think of when I say atmospheric science, because um, this is a pretty broad term. Um, so what comes to mind for you all? And feel free to answer out loud or in the chat. I think about weather sort of related stuff and what my 10 day forecast is gonna tell me. Any other thoughts? Um, People in the chat have mentioned, the chat? yeah, they're mentioning climate change. Oh, somebody mentioned the West Coast photos. Um, okay. Dynamics of layers, differential equations, hurricanes, math. Cool. Um, so those answers sort of span a broad range of time and spatial scales, right? So we'll talk about each of those. Um, let's start with the time scales. The two timescales that people sort of mentioned here um, were kind of weather scales, sort of what happens in a few days, maybe a couple of weeks at most, um, and sort of climate scales, right? How things change sort of over decades or even centuries. Uh, and we sort of think of the same physics as happening on both of these scales, right? We don't think the dynamics of the atmosphere sort of fundamentally changes. So what's the difference here um, in these two timescales? From a mathematical perspective, we can think about it in terms of where our information about predictability or variability comes from. Right? In the short term scale, sort of looking at weather, what we know really comes from initial conditions. What is the state of the atmosphere right now? And how do we use that to understand what will happen soon? Right? So this is somehow an initial value problem if we think kind of in differential equations terms. For questions of climate and especially climate change, looking over decades or centuries, you know, the temperatures and pressures everywhere in the world right now probably don't tell us that much. And so our information instead is really coming from boundary conditions, right? Things like what is happening in the ocean, what is happening with how land is used, uh, what are human emissions, of carbon dioxide going to look like for the next 80 years. So our sources of information are from these different places. And we have these sort of different kinds of differential equation problems. Um, and one more thing about weather, right? Why is it sort of such a short scale, right? Why am I limiting weather to, to only about two weeks? Uh, well, once we formulate this uh, sort of as a set of equations, all the different variables sort of depend on each other in, in not particularly nice ways, right? So these end up being nonlinear equations. This is a nonlinear system. And, and so what we get is uh, even if sort of initial conditions are very close to each other within the error of what we can measure, after two or three weeks, you get vastly different predictions. So, so the usefulness of our initial conditions sort of runs out. 
there was also a, a wide range of um, sort of in the middle there that people didn't really mention. Um, right, we don't just want to know things about the next two weeks or the next few decades. Things sort of change in the middle there too, or vary in the middle. Um, so something I'll come back to later is my work, which is mostly in the sub-seasonal to seasonal space, uh, two weeks to six months, where maybe initial values have some usefulness, um, but then it turns into mostly a boundary value problem. Folks also mentioned a wide range of spatial scales, right? Sort of daily weather um, could look like, you know, thunderstorms. It could like a cold front coming through. But there are also things on planetary scales, like jet streams, or if you're thinking about climate, like global climate change. So we're really interested in everything that's happening from like one kilometer all the way up to thousands of kilometers. So we have a wide range of time scales and a wide range of spatial scales. And this is really difficult to deal with. Um, and it's what makes this uh, both an interesting and hard problem. Uh, there's one more thing that contributes to that. Uh, and it's the fact that the atmosphere doesn't just sort of sit in its own nice little box. So this is coming back to the boundary conditions that I mentioned before, right? The ocean is sort of its own system that's very complicated, has a lot going on. Uh, the land is its own system, right? Land use changes, there are vegetation cycles, there are carbon and nitrogen cycles. Uh, we have human contributions and responses to things going on in the rest of this system. We have solar radiation, uh, we have chemicals in the atmosphere, right? So all of these things are interacting. We can think of all these other systems sort of as providing our boundary conditions to the atmosphere, um, but the atmosphere is also coupled back to them. Um, so this is a really sort of messily nonlinear coupled system. Uh, and, and we can't really just sort of go outside and do experiments on it. Uh, so what tools do we actually have to understand it? So first off, we have observations, right? And these come in a variety of formats, um, which have been valued to different degrees um, by science over the course of history. Uh, so I want to be sure to mention that there are a lot of communities, in particular ind indigenous communities, that have very long-term knowledge of their environments, right? And this is sort of important information uh, to them and to everyone else. Um, and it's really important not to discount it. Uh, we also have other sources of observations. Um, you may think of weather stations and weather balloons. Uh, ships, buoys, and planes all collect uh, weather and climate information. Um, satellites are also a really important uh, source of information about our atmosphere um, that I in particular draw on. But you might notice that these observations come from uh, really different sources that probably aren't evenly distributed in space and time. Uh, and that can make them difficult to deal with. So what we often do instead of dealing with the raw observations is we, we sort of incorporate those observations into models um, through a mathematical process called data assimilation um, that has really grown as a, as a mathematical field working in concert uh, with meteorology and uh, climate science. So reanalysis sort of gives us a more consistent uh, data set to work with that represents the observations. And then we have the weather and climate models themselves, right? Our sort of mathematical expressions of what's going on in the atmosphere. Um, and these are what I'm going to focus on. And we use them not only for prediction, like weather prediction and climate prediction that you might think of, um, but for a couple of other purposes. We might want to understand uh, the physical mechanism of how something is happening in the atmosphere. Or we might sort of want to disentangle uh, two different processes that often occur together in the atmosphere, right? And this might be different, difficult to do from the data, um, either because we can't really separate them there, um, it would be unphysical, or because we simply don't have enough observations. Um, so this is a place where we can use models. So there's a wide variety of types of models as well um, for different questions. These are really just a few of them. Um, but I'll start sort of from the most 
basic and conceptual up to sort of the most computational and complex, right? We have something that I'll call a conceptual model. This is sort of as minimal as possible, generally a, a small set of, of tractable mathematical equations um, that we don't necessarily need a computer to solve, um, looking to understand a single phenomenon, um, often trying to explain how or why that phenomenon happens. And I'll come back to an example of that in a bit. Sort of going up in computational complexity, um, but maybe down in scale, we have large eddy simulations or cloud resolving models. These are really high spatial and time resolution models that we use for particular purposes, generally to understand pretty small scale processes, often related to clouds or atmospheric convection. Um, and then we can sort of think very large scale, right? A general circulation model is something that tries to capture the full atmosphere system. It can't do so at a very high resolution. It's really just interested in sort of broad fluid dynamics and thermodynamics of the atmosphere. And then those general circulation models for the atmosphere are pieces of an Earth system model that incorporate those other ocean, ice, and land systems I talked about earlier. So I'll come back to all of these except the large eddy simulations. Uh, but right now I'm going to dive a little bit more into general circulation models and Earth system models. So what does a general circulation model look like? We sort of split up the atmosphere into little cubes, right? We, we put a grid on the sphere and then have multiple layers in the atmosphere. Each of those boxes talk to each other horizontally and vertically. Um, and, and they're sort of each computing some key atmospheric variables like temperature or pressure or wind. Um, but what are, what are the equations that each of these boxes is sort of looking at? Um, first, we have an ideal gas law. Right, something that just relates different thermodynamic fields. Uh, this is not a prediction equation, right? It's sort of true everywhere, all the time, uh, just holding these variables together. Then we get into the prediction equations, right? We have a temperature tendency telling us how temperature changes in space and time. This is really energy conservation beneath the surface. We also have momentum conservation that's in our wind tendencies. Um, sort of how parcels of air move in space and time. We have what we call continuity equations. Um, these are a mass conservation, but not just globally, but locally, saying, you know, sort of if this air parcel moves, you know, some air must be coming from somewhere else. So it's a really strong mass conservation condition. Then there are a lot of other processes that we can't really include at this large scale, uh, right? These uh, general circulation models tend to have pretty low spatial resolution. So lots of things related to clouds, convection, radiation sort of happen at sub-grid box scale. So we have to put simplified models sort of in each grid box uh, for those things. Um, so there's, there's sort of a lot of work there trying to make that as accurate as possible. And then how do we fit all these pieces together? We need a lot of numerics, right? We have to make decisions about sort of how we set up our grid on the sphere. There are a couple of ways that are common for people to do this. We have to choose numerical methods for all these different processes and figure out how they fit together. Uh, so there's also a, a lot of work in that space. So I'll go into a little more detail on one of these equations, just as an example. So here's our horizontal momentum equation. So what we're looking at here is how air parcels move east, west, and north, south in space and time. Right? So the, the quantity we're interested in is this vector u. Uh, that's a wind vector. It contains the east-west winds and the north-south winds. And the quantity on the left is a total derivative of that wind. Uh, so instead of thinking about us sort of staying at one spot in physical space and seeing how the wind changes there, think about moving with an air parcel and how its velocity changes in space or time. 
mathematically, what we're really doing here is, is chain rule, right? So this isn't just partial u partial t, we're, we're doing a chain rule. And then the right side tells us sort of all the pieces that contribute to changes in those velocities. So our first term, that g vector is gravity, right? Gravity is an acceleration acting on all the air parcels. So it should change their velocities. We'll jump to the last term. That's a centrifugal force related to the Earth's rotation. So generally, we'll sort of group those two together and just treat it as an adjusted gravity. The next term, the vector f, is friction. That one's generally not super important on sort of global scales. But the next term is really important. This p is pressure. So that's a gradient of pressure. Right? So this is telling us that pressure differences at different locations in space sort of uh, accelerate or decelerate our air parcels. Um, and in fact, sort of if we ignore rotation of the Earth, winds would go down pressure gradients. This is sort of where they want to go. Um, except the Earth does rotate. And our next term is a Coriolis term, right? That omega is related to the rotation of the Earth. And so this is a term that is going to turn, in some sense, our winds, right? So in the northern hemisphere, it will, it will tend to turn everything to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it will tend to turn everything to the left. So now our winds, instead of going down pressure gradients, it go along-ish pressure contours, but not exactly. So this is the sort of thing that's hiding inside a GCM. And I said these general circulation models are part of Earth system models. So here's what those look like. We have the general circulation model for the atmosphere, along with some calculation of atmospheric chemistry. Uh, we also have a GCM for the ocean and a model for the land. Right? And then sea ice and land ice models tend to sort of go with the ocean and land models, respectively. Right? And these all serve as boundary conditions for each other. Um, but for simplicity, we don't have them talk to each other directly. Instead, they talk to a central piece uh, that we call the coupler. This means that we can, we can fiddle around with the individual model components or sort of switch them out um, to do experiments and not have to mess with, with how the pieces talk to each other um, because that sort of lives in its own space. Okay, so that was sort of a broad overview of atmospheric models. Uh, so now let's look at how we can use them in a particular situation. Uh, so what I study is the two lowest layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere and the stratosphere. Uh, and then above that is the mesosphere. Uh, the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere tends to be from about uh, 10 kilometers near the poles to maybe 15 to 18 kilometers uh, in the tropics. Um, but these are two really different layers of the atmosphere. Uh, most of the things that you think of as weather happen down here in the troposphere. Uh, that lower boundary is also really bumpy, right? There's land and ice and ocean. Not all of it is even, right? There's topography. Lots of things sort of bubble up because the troposphere is inherently unstable. Uh, the stratosphere, in contrast, is super stable. Um, it's called the stratosphere because it's stratified. Um, and it really only gets bothered by some of those things that propagate up from the troposphere. Uh, and it, it really only has a, sort of a few key features, whereas lots of stuff happens in the troposphere. Um, but one of those stratospheric features is what I study, and it's the polar vortex. Uh, so do any mental images come to mind for people when I say the word polar vortex? I remember it being really, really cold here for a few days, and people were talking that it was a polar, vo polar vo vortex, and that was why. It makes me want to get a jacket. Okay. Yeah, so that's something like this, right? Meteorologist showing a region of strong cold sort of descending into the United States. That's the guy. That's the guy I was thinking. <laughs> that's the picture. 
But alas, the term polar vortex is overloaded in atmospheric science. And that is not the one I mean. That is a different polar vortex. That is the tropospheric polar vortex. Um, they are related, uh, kind of. Um, right, and it's really just the tropospheric polar vortex, what you see here on the left, is really just wiggles in sort of the mid-latitude jet stream. Uh, what I study is the stratospheric polar vortex higher up, and it's a somewhat more consistent feature of the winter atmosphere. But it's still related to winds and cold temperatures and low pressures. Um, and we define it based on, our, on the winds, so let's look at that. Uh, so what this plot shows is we've taken east-west winds, averaged them over December to February, and then also average them around latitude circles. So we're sort of taking a, an average slice. Uh, and the North Pole's on the left, uh, South Pole's on the right. We denote west to east or westerly winds as positive and east to west winds as negative. Um, so we can sort of see a few features here. In the troposphere down below, there are those two big regions of positive winds. Those are the subtropical jet streams. But then up in the stratosphere, there's another region of strong west to east winds. That's the stratospheric polar vortex. And it sort of lives over the winter pole, encircles it, uh, encloses a, a region of strong cold air. And I've put an X at the latitude of 60 north and the pressure level of 10 hectopascal. And that pressure level tends to be around 30 kilometers. Um, and that X is because this is sort of where we measure how strong the polar vortex is. Um, and so that's the point where we can sort of look to see how it evolves. So these are two plots related to its evolution. The one on the left is that measure of e average east-west wind at that 60 north latitude and 10 hectopascal pressure. And the figure on the right is, is temperature around the same spot. The black lines show the average over the past 40 years. The gray regions are sort of a measure of uncertainty. And then the red lines are what happened in 2017 to 2018. Uh, so what sorts of things uh, do you notice or wonder related to either of these plots or any potential relationships between them? happened in February 2018. Yeah, something something weird happened in February 2018. You can unmute and ask Emily. Don't worry. Does they have a hand raised? That's right. It looks like they kind of have like an opposite type of concavity to each other, right? So like the, the zonal wind one is going up and then coming back down. The mean temperature one's going down and then coming back up. Okay. They're somehow each other flipped. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's some sort of inverse relationship here. Right? So so the, the polar vortex, right, we sort of have winds over the pole that are weakly east to west during the summer. Right. And then sometime in late August, early September, uh, they switch directions. Right. And the polar vortex sort of builds up maybe to an average speed of 40 meters per second in December and January, right? And then it dies off sometime in mid-April on average, right? And the temperature is doing something opposite. Um, but if we look at the variability, right, there, there's sort of very little in the summer or fall. It's pretty consistent. And then we hit winter and spring, right? And there's this huge possible range of values. I and mean, we can sort of see what might be happening there um, by what BK pointed out, which is something happened in February 2018, where the winds really rapidly decelerated and in fact reversed direction. Right? And that lines up pretty exactly with a huge temperature spike. Right? Um, if you try to look at the values there, that's maybe 25 Kelvin in a couple of days, uh, which is uh, absurd. Uh, so this event is called wow. I don't know anything about the stratosphere. Yeah. Um, is there like an average wind speed or is that a terrible vector calculus question? But uh, is there an average wind speed 
So what's the scale on this compared to other wins? Right. Um, so sort of the higher up you go, uh, the, fa the faster wins you're going to see um, in, in the winter, at least. Um, so in the northern hemisphere, right, at 40 is, is sort of what we expect in midwinter. Strong would be 60. Uh, the southern hemisphere is really different. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. So, so that, that temperature spike is what we call a, a sudden stratospheric warming. Uh, and despite the fact that we name it after the temperature spike, we define it based on that wind reversal. Um, and so we say that this, this sudden warming happens when our winds go from west to east and become east to west, sort of in the middle of winter at this particular spot where we're measuring it. Um, and why do we care about these? They end up having surface effects for a couple of months. But sort of the first question when people saw these was what, what is going on here, right? How is this happening? Um, this seems like a really large and unusual change. Uh, so this is where a conceptual model might come in. Um, but let's sort of look at what's happening a little more closely first to try to get a sense. Uh, so what's sort of being pictured here is uh, uh, vorticity. It's a measure of, of sort of how much things are spinning around. So this red purple swatch in the middle is the polar vortex. This is late January 2018. So we're about two weeks out from this sudden warming. A week later, the polar vortex got stretchy. And then we hit the day before the official sudden warming and it's sort of pinched in the middle, right? And so the polar vortex has basically broken down. It's in two pieces, it's pushed off the pole. Um, and so you can think of much warmer air as sort of rushing in to the pole when this happens. So, so this is sort of the phenomenon we want to explain as simply as possible. If we're doing that, what do we want the model to capture? Right? We want it to explain how and why the winds reverse so suddenly from what they do on average. And we would like to know why this, is uh, why this comes with a, a strong temperature spike. And the first question has sort of a standard answer in atmospheric science. Anything that messes with the mean state of the circulation is basically due to waves. Um, these are just periodic disturbances to some atmospheric variable. Uh, but there's one thing that's tricky about this. And this is my single theorem for this talk. This is the non-acceleration theorem. And it tells us under what conditions waves cannot sort of modify the average flow. Uh, waves don't sort of touch the flow if they're steady, um, non-dissipative or conservative. If they're of small amplitudes, we can basically treat them as linear. Um, and if they don't affect the boundary conditions. Uh, if you study waves, this is equivalent to them uh, sort of having no critical levels. Um, but here, we're trying to use waves to explain a change to this average flow which means at least one of these conditions must be violated. Uh, and it turns out that sort of in the full process, multiple of them are, but the big one is this first one. Um, we're going to have non-steady waves. Uh, so this model is based on work by a Japanese scientist, Matsuno, and was published in 1971. Uh, so his setup was a simplified set of atmospheric equations um, called the quasi-geostrophic equations. Um, they're based on the shallow water equation, so basically assuming thickness doesn't matter too much, um, that sort of the Coriolis force is the most important term, and that we're not thinking about a sphere, we're just sort of attaching a tangent plane at the right spot. And then the other piece we need is these non-steady waves, right? Sudden, large waves moving upwards, right? And we'll sort of assume there were, there were no waves moving up before this wave that we're looking at, but then that there keeps being steady wave activity behind it. And the story we're going to tell is that there's this large burst of wave activity 
that manages to reach the stratosphere. And that because they're non-steady, they can affect the mean state. And in this case, they'll decelerate those strong west to east winds and eventually reverse them. So a very rough picture of what that looks like. Um, from the quasi-geostrophic equations, we can find that if we have a wave moving up, it must be moving heat uh, poleward. So we have a poleward heat flux. And on the picture on the right, this average V prime B prime is our heat flux. Uh, so we're saying we have a strong poleward, like towards positive Y heat flux right at this red arrow, which is our wave going up. Um, and so that sort of gives us differences in, um, in the heat flux divergence to either side of our wave front. And those differences um, mean that we get sort of upward motion to one side of the wave, the pole side, and downward motion to the other side, right? But these can't sort of extend infinitely. So somewhere right at the top of the wave, they must connect. Um, and that connection is sort of movement from the pole towards the equator. So you can see in the dotted arrows on the right, we sort of have this circulation forming. But earlier, I said that the Coriolis effect basically turns um, any of these winds that we have. And so this equatorward motion gets turned right in the Northern Hemisphere. And so it gets turned to go east to west, right? And so that motion is what's going to slow down our winds. This is sort of the high level picture of, of this conceptual model of what's happening. Um, and it's been refined since then, um, but it explains a lot of the observations pretty well. Okay, so now we know something about how an SSW works. How do they matter for us? Um, and the answer is yes. So after that wind reversal happens, uh, for about two weeks, we get uh, a cold and dry Northern Europe, a warm and wet Southern Europe, um, some different pressures than normal in the Northern Atlantic, and sometimes some effects in North America. So that 2018 SSW I've been showing you um, was followed by four nor'easters uh, in the span of about six weeks um, that were sort of largely attributable to that event. So, so this is something we really want to understand um, because it can help us make predictions ahead of time for what a winter will be like, um, which is good for a variety of sort of government services and industries. Uh, so what are the questions we can ask about these? Uh, right, we, can, we could ask how we predict these sudden warmings um, or what features tend to precede them. Is the further in advance we can predict them, sort of the further in advance we can understand their effects. We can ask more about their impacts, um, sort of how do those effects come down from the stratosphere? That's not super well understood. Does anything else in the atmosphere sort of interact with those impacts? We can ask the climate change question, um, right? How, if at all, will sudden warmings change in the future? We can think about other atmospheric phenomena, interacting with sudden warmings occurring or their impacts. Um, and then we can ask a question sort of about models themselves. Um, how well do models represent processes related to these events? So I'll give you a couple of examples of questions here. Um, and I'll talk about one a little more. Uh, so ozone is a really important part of the stratosphere. That's where the ozone layer lives. Um, and ozone chemistry and transport has a lot to do with the winter polar stratosphere. Um, so how, if at all, do ozone chemistry and, and movement relate to sudden warmings and their surface impacts, right? And this touches on impacts and interactions. It's also related to models um, because trying to calculate all the sort of chemical reactions of ozone and how it moves 
is really computationally expensive. So if this isn't important, then we don't need to include it in our models. Uh, so this is, this is a question that sort of have, has implications across all these areas. Uh, here's another question, uh, sort of focusing in on impacts and interactions. If we have uh, uh, different states of El Nino or La Nina, right, sort of a big driver of uh, climate in the Pacific, does that affect uh, sort of the impacts of sudden warmings at all? Uh, so I'm happy to talk more later about the ozone question, but this is the one that I'll go into in a little more detail. Uh, so here are sea surface temperatures related with a very related to a very strong El Nino. And so we sort of identify it by this this region of the sea surface in the equatorial Pacific. Um, this is a sort of a, a nine degree Fahrenheit difference from average is pretty big. Um, and this induces a lot of uh, changes to the atmospheric circulation and to waves right, that can change um, sort of rain and uh, drought patterns along the West Coast, in South America, Australia, um, and East Asia. Right, so, so this is sort of a, a main driver for this whole Pacific region. Um, but maybe it has impacts through um, through the stratosphere for the North Atlantic as well. And so we're interested sort of in how the surface impacts change with different phases. And we'll look at two phases. We'll sort of look at what we'll call ENSO neutral. These are average sea surface temperatures in the Pacific and those El Nino events, right? So a particularly warm equatorial Pacific. And so our model set up here um, is, is we basically do two simulations, each 200 years long. And what we've done is we've taken out the ocean model and we're just feeding it particular values. Right? So we're sort of giving it an annual cycle of sea surface temperatures as the ocean boundary condition. And in one case, um, those are from uh, sort of years with, with average sea surface temperatures. And in the other case, it, it's from years with these, these warm sea surface temperatures. And, and we're going to look at, at the difference. So why are we using models here, right? It's not really for prediction. Uh, this is a case where we're trying to tease apart two phenomena in a way that we can't really do in the real world, right? We're doing something that's a little unphysical here. Uh, we could also try to answer it with observations, um, but there just isn't that much data. Uh, we don't have records of the stratosphere for that long. Uh, so this is tricky to answer well from, ob from observed data. So once we have these two simulations, we'll find the sudden warmings in each set, and we'll compare North Atlantic climate in years with sudden warmings to years without sudden warmings in each of these two conditions. Um, and here's what we get. The top row is temperatures, the bottom row is precipitation. Um, and these are differences in the years with sudden warmings and without sudden warmings under the two conditions, average and El Nino. Um, the first thing to note is uh, these numbers in brackets. Uh, those are how many sudden warmings occurred across the 200 years of simulation. Uh, so those are really different, right? We saw almost twice as many sudden warmings in El Nino years as neutral and so years. Um, so whether or not El Nino is sort of affecting what sudden warmings do at the surface, uh, they sure matter for how often sudden warmings happen, right? And that's useful on its own. But then we can look at the surface uh, and the precipitation plots look about the same, right? So El Nino doesn't seem to be affecting sort of how SSWs change precipitation patterns at the surface. The temperature patterns are also similar, though there's maybe some difference um, sort of in uh, Northern Eurasia, right? That we're, we're getting stronger cooling um, in neutral and so than El Nino itself. But overall, 
uh, there's not that big a difference here sort of in the surface impacts we see due to sudden warmings under these two conditions. The difference is how often they happen. But that's still important. Uh, we're pretty good at predicting El Nino maybe six months in advance um, for winter. And so what this means is if we know winters with sudden warmings tend to be colder and drier in Northern Europe, warmer and wetter in Southern Europe, and we know that El Nino makes sudden warmings much more likely. As soon as we know it's probably an El Nino year, we can sort of react accordingly. Uh, so I'll stop and summarize there. Right, so atmospheric variability sort of occurs and is important on this huge range of time and spatial scales. Right? But the variability and predictability come from different sources thinking about initial versus boundary conditions. Um, these large comprehensive climate models are, are helpful, not only for prediction, the way we might hear them talk about, talked about, but also for understanding physical processes, um, especially if maybe we don't have enough observed data, um, or if there's something that we can't really do physically, um, some experiment we want to run that we can do in the model, but not the real world. Um, and then finally, I hope I've convinced you um, that the polar stratosphere uh, is an important thing to pay attention to if you're thinking about winter climate uh, in the North Atlantic. So I'll stop there and take questions. Everyone wants to unmute and give a round of applause to Jesse for giving our talk. And if anyone has a question. Yeah. We have a couple them. of questions about numerical things. So like, you know, I certainly heard in a long time ago that weather is chaotic and you sort of mentioned that at the beginning, why the initial conditions matter a lot and that new, the numerical methods you choose for the, each piece matters. And then you, you talked about sort of running it 200 times. Um, I'm not a numerical analyst, so I have no sense of how to think about the probability of changes and the sensitivity. So like, how do you manage that with these, how do you manage that chaos in the com computation way? Yeah, so the running 200 times is actually largely due um, to the chaos. Um, so those 200 times uh, in, in that project, um, we're actually all sort of initialized, um, we started them all on, on July 1st of, of our model year. Um, and that July 1st only differed um, from all the other July 1sts um, by some like machine precision change to the atmospheric temperature, um, right? And then there's some spread in the results because of that chaos, right? But then we're sort of taking an average across all the versions of the 200 years that we end up caring about. So the hope in doing that sort of ensemble and then average is that we're really getting the signal and, and letting sort of the noise cancel it, cancel itself out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably the most common way in climate science to deal with it is, is to run these ensembles and look at, look at the mean. Yeah. Um, and then sort of within that there, like if you look at a data set and you, you start asking new and new questions, eventually you're going to find something with a, a low P value. Is there, is there some sort of sense of like, you have to decide in advance that, you know, that you were looking for these sudden changes. So you don't say like, Hey, I run 200 miles and this is radically different. Therefore El Nino is important. So, Climate science is not to the point of like free registering hypotheses, um, but people do generally go in with a, a particular question um, and often a particular hypothesis. Um, that said, there, there are a lot of questionable statistical practices in the field, um, folks are working on it. 
Great. Um, Joshua, I'm not sure I understand your question in any more detail. You want to unmute and ask it? I was just curious as to about, uh, uh, I, I know a tiny bit about numerical analysis. I was just curious as to, to uh, what, uh, uh, what numerical approximation methods uh, uh, your simulations were using. Um, so it varies a lot by model and also by component. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I know of, of finite difference, finite volume, and spectral models. So, and, and so it's just tailored to what seems best for the particular component? Yeah, and, and people will work very hard over many years on, on sort of changing um, sort of the piece of the model to, to something new if they think it will be better. Um, so the US uh, sort of forecast model, um, GFS, fairly recently switched over to um, sort of its, its dynamical core, where those main dynamical equations of motion live, um, being a finite volume model. Um, and it was not before. Uh, but people also mess around with uh, the grid spacing, um, right? You might think it's most natural to sort of do latitude circles and longitude circles, um, but that gives you some weird properties. And so people will do sort of like cubed sphere things instead. Um, it's, it's all over the place. One interesting thing I'm hearing what you're saying, though, is that there's like a open access-ish kind of nature to like there's so many pieces and they all have to be out there you can't run your new bit of the model without running it in the context of everything else is that sort of a distinctive element of this research community so i hadn't thought about it that way before um but but probably um uh it's it's not too hard to sort of, for your particular experiment, make a, a sort of small change to a broader model. They're difficult, but relatively clear for how complicated these things are, sort of ways and processes for doing that. Um, and then there are people and community members who, who sort of work on building new pieces of the model. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a very communal effort. Cool. So the other question we had in the chat was from TJ. Um, can you tell us anything about the hexagonal polar vortex on, was it Saturn? Um, so I don't know much about it, um, but yes, uh, it, um, it's, it, it's basically the same kind of feature. Um, I don't know why it's hexagonal. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done much with planetary atmospheres. Um, uh, but yeah, a lot of these processes also happen um, on other planets. Um, so one of my colleagues who is here, uh, Zane Martin, um, studies or has studied in the past uh, tropospheric winds sort of near the equator. Uh, sorry, stratospheric winds near the equator instead of near the pole. Um, and there's a process uh, that happens on Earth that's very similar to one that happens on Jupiter, uh, which I think is delightful. Those are the questions I noticed. Other people? We can unmute and thank Jesse again. Yay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I will share um, about our speaker next week is Cameron Williams from the University of Hawaii, and they'll be telling us about incompleteness and the universal algorithm and al arithmetic potentialism. So that will be a really fun talk. Um, this one will be uh, uploaded to YouTube shortly. Hopefully, Drew will be able to tackle that for us. And then we will see everybody back here um, next Thursday. I'm going to stop the recording. I can figure out where the stop button went.
gonna stop the recording, but everyone's welcome to hang out and ask Jesse more questions or just chat.